Okay. Are you going to yeah, kick I'm it off? All right. Off. Okay, we'll just kick it off anyway. So here we go. Um, so Declan, I'll leave you to do the introductions and get it kicked off. Okay, so in this session, we're going to talk about um, the new proposed library called RT Security. Um, and this, the library is, it's enabling hardware acceleration of, well, in, in general terms of security protocols, specifically in the case of what we have on the mailing list today, it's um, IPsec. So um, this is going to be a joint presentation between myself, Declan Doherty, and from with Intel and Shannon, uh, from Boris from Mellanox, and Heman from NXP. Um, so in, in the presentation today, we're just going, I'm going to give a brief introduction to the library, um, to, I'm, I'm going to take a walk through the actual different acceleration modes, and then Hemman's going to talk about the actual details of the library, um, and then Boris will go through a summary and future work, and then we'll have a Q&A question, a session at the end. So just a brief introduction. So the, the library really provides a framework for managing the hardware acceleration of security protocols. Um, there are a generic set of APIs that are defined, are, which are trying to, to enable um, not non-protocol uh, specific uh, implementation. So we, we see this as in longer term, and being able to enable a whole range of security pro protocols, acceleration and hardware. Um, so the security library itself, at a very high level term, a high level view sits uh, above its device independence. So today, in the RF, the, the first patch set, the collaborative patch set that we have on the mailing list, it, it can the security can, library can be implemented either on top of an uh, actual net uh, Polmo driver or the crypto PMD. So it works on both devices and, and it provides a consistent API for enabling the offloads on those devices. Um, but at the moment, it's only being enabled for IPsec. And in the longer term, as I said, we, we, we'd see a whole range of possible protocols that could be enabled through this mechanism. So just kind of a little bit of background on, on, on this work. It's been a collaborative effort um, between Intel, Malinox, and NXP, and there's been a, a number of contributors. Um, and the, the, this effort ha has come out uh, so there was, there was a couple of RFCs involved in this one by myself and uh, Radu uh, for, based on a crypto dev approach. Then there's the RT flow enablement approach that Boris submitted. And then there was uh, some work, an, an RFC then um, from Henman and Akil from NXP uh, for their mode. So we set up a a, a draft uh, repo on dpdk.org. So we've been working collaboratively to develop a single solution that can meet all of the different types of accelerations, which I'm going to walk through now in a moment. Um, because th th this, is, this, this security, this offload can be implemented in a lot of different ways. And there's a, we wanted to get one, one API set that it was generic enough to allow applications to use any of them while still al allowing for all of the subtleties of the different approaches. Um, so IPsec in 30 seconds, it's, just, it's a layer three security service uh, on the IP layer. It gives um, integrity, uh, data confidentiality, so it's got some sequence inte integrity and some limited flow confidentiality. So there, there's, two, there's two modes of uh, IPsec in terms of transport and tunnel. So in tunnel, you've got an extra uh, IP header added on that side. Um, I've just shown here the ESP header, which is, um, is encapsulating security payload mo uh, mode of the protocol. There's also authentication header mode, which only gives you the uh, integrity, it doesn't uh, handle encryption. Um, so, and it's IPsec is also crypto algorithm independent. So I'm gonna take a quick walk through of the different acceleration modes. Um, mainly we've been concentrating on the inline crypto acceleration and there's a look aside protocol acceleration. 
There's also scope for understanding inline protocol offload. Um, and I, we have one slide on that, but we haven't been, haven't done any enablement of that yet. So it's kind of speculative and that we have all of the uh, cases handled for that. Um, so inline crypto acceleration for IPsec. So it's an IO based um, acceleration performed on the interface on ingress and egress. So in general, you're not modifying uh, the packet headers at all here. You're just doing encryption, decryption, and authentication operations in the hardware, and you're giving that state back to the, on an ingress, you're giving that state back to the application to say whether the operations have been successfully completed. Um, and if the, uh, 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 and on, on an ingress, Sorry, on Ingress also, you're getting the, the full packet is decapsulated. So one interesting, another element of inline crypto is one, once you do that offload, uh, it requires that C the Ethernet CRC is also offloaded for egress traffic because you, you won't be able to calculate the correct CRC until after the encryption has taken place. So I've got a couple of uh, pipeline stages descriptions which are trying to look at the different processing models here. So starting from left to right, you've got an encrypted IPsec tunnel packet coming into your system. Um, on the hardware device, it's classifying the packets. And if inline crypto has been enabled, what you'll find, so the yellow here is the modification. The packet is now, it will be fully decrypted after the inline stage. Uh, but the packet is left pretty much intact. There's no, you don't strip any of the headers. But there's state passed to the pull mode driver through your application into your IPsec stack. Um, if the, so we have, on ingress, we have OL flags, a new OL flag to find to say the packet has been parsed in line. Um, and that allows you to bypass the, the crypto stages that would normally perform to this point on the host. Um, so you just need to check status. So at this point, you've got a, your full packet in plain text. And then the, the last stage, I guess the post, the post crypto stage is still the same where you're just decapsulating the ESP header. And, and in this case, the IPsec uh, stack is still handling all of the state in regards to the security uh, tunnel. Um, so that's some text just kind of describing that. I'll leave that for details. Egress is so is slightly, uh, slightly different in we, we, we're supporting two models. The, the model that uh, Intel supports on our Niantic device is slightly different from what is supported on the, the Malinox device. Um, so again, the IPsec stack in software is doing all of the packet manipulation. So it's installing the tunnel header. In this case, this is an example of tunnel DSP. It's setting up the ESP header, setting sequence numbers there. In, uh, in the Intel case, it's required that padding and the ESP, um, the, the ESP uh, footer uh, is configured by the software stack on, in, on the Malnox solution that can be offloaded to hardware. And we're giving details of that uh, capabilities through some of the feature capabilities in the API when you're discovering capabilities. Um, so once the so you can, again, skip the actual host-based crypto processing, so either CPU or maybe you're, you could be offloading to Accelerator. You can skip that in the inline case, and your packet can then traverse the rest of the, your processing stack and be transmitted um, onto the pull mode driver. Um, in the case of the Intel mode, the pull mode driver is required to give metadata to the hardware to tell it what uh, security session is needed to do the crypto processing. So you're specifically tell, saying at this point, while passing the packet down, that it needs to be processed in line crypto. Um, in the case of the Mellanox implementation, the hardware is able to classify and automatically uh, give that packet. But we've managed, managed to kind of encapsulate those semantics in a generic way. Uh, so it should be quite easy to to integrate applications that use, e using either method. And then after your inline crypto stage in your hardware, your packet gets, uh, gets encrypted and your authentication digest gets populated in the packet before egressing the physical hardware. 
So the, the next mode is a, a leukocyte protocol acceleration. Um, and this, this is uh, based on a similar concept to uh, a, just a leukocyte hardware accelerator like we, we have for, for just doing crypto. But in, in this case, the hardware is capable of managing all of the uh, protocol state and, and header manipulations as well. Um, and the sequence number and anti-replay windows. So in this case, the, this is an example pipeline of, of that implementation. So you've got, a, in, in this case, in, that, uh, in the <coughs> NIC, you've, uh, hardware NIC, it's just pass, passing the packet through to the pole mode driver uh, on modified. Uh, you get, again, to your IPsec stage here in the dark blue, and your the, when you do your SA lookup, um, you can see that that uh, SA, we've decided that we're going to offload to a leukocyte accelerator. And at that point, you can skip the, the what I've called the IPsec pre-crypto stage, which would be uh, the management of the SP header, and et cetera. And you can just pass that pa full packet straight to your leukocyte accelerator. And it can handle the decryption and the decapsulation of the IPsec packet. And then the, the packet is, you, obviously you'll get some state back whether the packet has been handled successfully and then it's back to your post-crypto stage and out into the, your application. Uh, on the egress, um, it's again a similar uh, model where the, after the security policy SA lookup, which is your SA is telling you it's going to handle leukocyte mode, the uh, the actual packet is passed to your leukocyte accelerator, which again does the encapsulation and encryption of the packet and calculation of the digest, uh, and then passes the ba packet back to your IPsec stack and is ready then for transmission. Um, the last model that we have comprehended in the API, but it's currently, there's no support implemented, so this probably is more subject to change uh, than the other models or it's less comprehended is uh, when you offload the uh, full protocol processing to the hardware, to the I.O. device. So you're giving a plain text packet directly to your NIC and at that point it's up to the NIC to classify that packet or maybe, maybe you've passed some metadata with the packet to tell it to do that processing. Um, and it's then responsible for doing all of the IPsec processing, the encapsulation, headers, uh, an IP header, plus encryption and authentication. The, one of the interesting things about this mode is that it also requires that when you're configuring the acceleration offload, you also need to give the details of the Ethernet header, so the source destination MAC that also aligns to that uh, tunnel, the IPsec tunnel, either it's transport uh, tunnel or, or, or of a, in uh, so it's a transport or in tunnel mode, you still need to say the, the MAC details that would go with that IPsec um, session. And that, I guess, is going to be a more tricky integration task for applications because you're, you're, it requires coupling of your layer two and your security stack. So that's kind of a, a general overview of the different protocol the acceleration models that we're hoping to support. And I'm now going to hand over to Hanman. He's going to take a walkthrough of the actual library implementation. Yep. <laughs> so as we understood from the uh, Declan that uh, the way we are trying to uh, put this library that this can work with different kind of devices, whether it's a crypto dev or it's an Ethernet uh, dev. So uh, the security instance management <laughs> abstraction, uh, it abstracts the completely uh, from the base device type and we are not targeting it for a one particular security protocol. So the way we have trying to design, try to design the API that they are protocol agnostic, so they can work for different kind of security protocols. Uh, uh, there is a definition of what kind of supported protocols are. But right now, uh, the proposal is limiting only to the IPsec, because that's the first goal we are trying to address. And eventually, we want to include more and more uh, security protocols to this proposal. Uh, in case of IPsec or any protocol, the basic crypto primitives we have reused from the crypto dev library rather than redefining them. And there are capability APIs are defined, which helps you in identifying what are the capability of underlying device. 
uh, what kind of action the underlying device can perform. So as I explained that this library is not specifically associated with any particular device instance, any driver, uh, Ethernet based, crypto dev, or any maybe newer in future, they can uh, register itself as a security capable device with the security uh, RT uh, security register API. Uh, so that library will come to know that these devices are capable and when required, the session can be created on these particular devices. The library maintains an array of the active instances which define the supported RT pro uh, security ops. And we are keeping a void pointer because device can be of any type. Uh, the API can be supported by multiple device types or possibly even as a standalone device in future. So the current structures look like that. There's a RT security API and there's a RT security context that can be based on the Ethernet DAB or it can be based on a crypto DAB. So in case of uh, Ethernet DAB, there are security ops are being registered with the device. In case of crypto DAB, again, security ops are being registered. So uh, the first thing when you uh, try to define a session, you identify what ki uh, kind of session protocol we are trying to address. It's RT session uh, protocol, whether it's IPsec, MacSec, SSL, PDCP, or whichever it is. Then uh, you select what kind of action type you are trying to perform, whether it's an inline crypto, inline protocol, or look aside protocol. Uh, this action type can be input for a given application when it's trying to do essay creation. And based on the action type, different underlying parameters can be configured. Because in some cases, like when you are doing a complete uh, protocol offload, you don't need to configure a few things, or vice versa. So with respect to the security session management, uh, the normal API is creating a security session. The security session constitute like you define what kind of action type you are performing, what is the protocol for this uh, security session is meant for, and then uh, the parameter for this particular protocol sessions. Like for example, in case of IPsec, there's an IPsec transform parameter you need to configure. And then uh, for the normal crypto primitive, you will be con uh, reusing the existing RT crypto symmetric transform. Right now we are only addressing the IPsec, so we are only uh, putting the symmetric transforms here. And then their API for updating, destroying, querying the stats, and any normal API which can be added here, uh, which are relevant for the RT security library. Uh, if we go uh, try to deeper into the IPsec transform, uh, so the current set supports the basic set of IPsec. Uh, like IPsec is also a pretty vast protocol. We can keep on adding more and more options based on the underlying hardware capability. So right now we have put a few basic parameters like SPI value, the SALT, uh, the SA options. Options can be like whether you want to support the extended sequence number, the net traversal, uh, the, uh, even on a UDP header you want to perform the L4 checksum or not. Uh, the QS and TOS, uh, like when you are uh, doing decryption or encryption, you want to copy the certain headers like DF bit or the QS related fields from inner to outer. Uh, then we want to add some trailers or you want to have the address copy or not. And uh, which kind of protocol you are addressing? Are you addressing only ESP or AH? Uh, whether it's for transport mode or tunnel mode, and then different parameters for the tunnel. The capability APIs, they allow the users to get all the capability of a device or to query a single capabilities. So uh, typically we have API for uh, RT security uh, capability gets, and this gives us a list of, uh, uh, like we can get a list of capabilities or we can Require, uh, we can query a particular capability. So one of the example like which the drivers will be implementing is the example of a uh, ingress uh, inline crypto capability. So, uh, where the inline crypto is supporting the protocol IPsec, it's providing support for ESP as a protocol in a transport mode and its direction dependence ingress and egress are separately defined. 
and with respect to the underlying crypto uh, capability, then you are putting your crypto primitives like AES GCM. Uh, given example is showing AES GCM, but they can, you can add more and more protocols here. So with respect to the control path, a user will first uh, inquire about the capability of the implementation. And based on the capability, it will go, go ahead and create the RT security session. The RT security session based on the underlying library availability ops, uh, it will call the session create. The session create, whether it's on the net device or crypto device, uh, it will configure the SA parameters to the hardware. In case of inline crypto, this is not sufficient. You also need to configure the classification flow. So there is a separate set of flow API changes which Boris is going to present. Uh, you need to configure uh, the flow parameters so that the net device related uh, it get programmed and then uh, once the flow is identified then the session uh, crypto session related operation can be done on those flows right. thanks simon so uh, the flow api is the control path for ethernet devices to configure rt security sessions what we see on the slide is uh, the actual packet format in its different stages as it goes through DPDK until it reaches hardware. The first stage is uh, the original IPv4 datagram that is then being processed to an uh, IPsec datagram with the ESP protocol encapsulation, including the header and the trailer. However, encryption hasn't been performed yet. Encryption is going to be performed by hardware, so this is the stage where we transform from software to hardware. And this is how the PMD sees the packet. So on the left side, we see a configuration of a session. As uh, Hammond demonstrated previously, we specify uh, all the information required in terms of encryption keys, the protocol. We specify the action type, which in this case is an inline crypto action, the SPI and the salt. Eventually, what's new here is that we use RT flow to actually configure the session to the Ethernet device. Uh, we specify if it's an ingress or an egress flow. Uh, then we specify the pattern, including the Ethernet header, the IPv4 header, and the ESP header. The IPv4 header and the ESP header are the pattern that identify the security association itself. So this is how we know that we need to apply this action. And finally, we specify the security session that we've just created previously as an action for RT flow. So once this control operation has been completed successfully, we can send packets using inline crypto. Uh, I'd like to show a few other examples that show the extensibility of this flow API. Uh, that will allow us to add support for new features in the future without modifying the RT security library and adding uh, network headers and definitions in crypto dev related uh, code. So in this example, we have a, a UDP and cup of ESP. Uh, and the only required change is that we add a UDP pattern in our RT flow configuration and we get support for UDP encapsulation in case our hardware and PMD support it as well. Another more advanced example is a configuration of ESP encapsulated in GRE. So uh, in this use case, we configure both the IP GRE pattern and the IP ESP pattern as well, uh, providing that to hardware and performing crypto offload on the payload itself. OK, now for some discussion items, mainly about uh, inline protocol. So just a quick reminder, uh, inline protocol offload means we offload the entire protocol, not just the encryption. So we need to pre perform also an encapsulation and decapsulation operation. Now, encapsulation and decapsulation is something that, uh, as far as I know, is, hasn't been done using RT flow. And it's something that we need to think about when we want to describe this. Uh, for instance, uh, do we need to define an order uh, for encapsulations and decapsulations uh, between patterns and actions? 
since uh, the packet, it looks differently for the PMD side and the network side, what should the pattern describe? Should it describe the, the PMD view or the network view? Uh, another question that was mentioned previously by Declan is how do we express the ARP entries that need to be configured for any protocol that performs IP encapsulation? So all of these questions need to be answered if we want to add uh, some encapsulation support in the data path using RTA flow. A suggestion for a possible solution is to describe in the pattern the network view. Always have all headers described. So in the case of IPsec in lane protocol offload, we would have the outer headers described as previously, the outer IP and ESP. However, in addition to that, we would describe also the inner packets, the inner IP and the inner TCP payload. And this is actually the payload that's going to be encrypted. However, if we offload both crypto and the protocol, we would see it as plain text in the NIC. So the pattern would include all of this information, and in addition, the action is going to overlap with the pattern describing the uh, full protocol offload, including the encapsulation parts. Uh, so our action is also going to have some more fields, and the pattern is going to, to overlap with that. The pattern essentially defines an order of encapsulations. So if we would support, for the previous example, with GRE and DSP, full offload of both, we could describe using the pattern both the GRE offload and the ESP offload and provide appropriate actions for encapsulation and decapsulation of both. Some points on the data path of inline protocol offload. The general idea is that it's possible to have fully transparent data path uh, offload of encapsulation in a security protocol uh, once configuration has been complete. So you could create an application that is not related to IPsec in any way, but it gets the benefits of IPsec via a different application that has configured uh, the appropriate control path. Uh, so this is one use case. Another use case is to use full protocol offload similarly to inline protocol, uh, inline crypto offload, where the application is, it knows it's going to do IPsec. However, it doesn't do much of IPsec since hardware does most of the work. Uh, so those are two different views. And uh, there are some questions because those views, they, they contradict each other in some ways. For instance, uh, we don't need Ember flags if the application doesn't know that self-load is being performed. It's transparent. So for one use case, we do need those, and for the other, we don't. Uh, there are also additional metadata that might be useful for some applications that know that IPsec offload is being fully performed by hardware, for instance, the security association identifier or the crypto result might be relevant for such an application. However, it's irrelevant for a transparent application. Uh, finally, we need to handle IP fragments somehow since it's not likely that hardware is going to perform IP reassembly. Uh, so the control path will need to handle IP fragments in both cases. Actually, in all cases, also in inline crypto, we do need to handle IP fragments. And uh, of course, we need some error handling. What happens if we have a failed decapsulation, a bad IP header, a bad ESP trailer, a, a sequence uh, overrun, etc.? We would probably need to have a more elaborate control API compared to RT security that uh, we have today. So to sum up, uh, RT security uh, is a representation <coughs> of a security session. It can be used for both Ethernet devices and crypto devices. Combined with RT flow, it's a powerful control plane. Uh, and it has some redundancy to its application integration with different offloads so that the application wouldn't need to change while providing different types of offloads. In the future, we would add support for further encapsulation, LSO, and checksum. 
uh, other inline offloads and protocols, and maybe even some software equivalent implementations. Questions? Hi, I have one uh, generic question about RSS. So after we enable a small about hardware feature, so after we enable in long uh, encryption and decryption in the NIC, so for example, in the RX side, right, uh, we will apply the, the NIC will apply the RSS rule after decryption, that's right? Well, yeah. that's a tricky question. I, th I think it, pro it probably depends on the, the hardware. And um, the value of using RSS on the inner packet, even if it's decrypted is, is for, for an inline crypto, I think is questionable of the value there because in a lot of cases you want to make sure the same tunnel or like security association is always managed on the same core. Otherwise, you're going to have to have some locking on the state of the security association. I think it's more applicable to the full inline protocol offload, if you're, if you're doing full decapsulation on hardware, then, then you would probably be much more interested in doing RSS on the inner packet then. So that means it's configurable, so? It's hardware dependent. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Oh. I'm very happy that you addressed the IP fragmentation. This is a question we from Ericsson side have been pushing very hard and it's both inner and outer tunnel if you're sort of pushing uh, inner tunnel. But, but, but I just had one question though. I, I think I saw you had a 16-bit identifier for flow and you were addressing also PDCP as a security protocol. Is that correct? You had the create, so, so create, you, the create method. Because I, I think it's sort of look, looking into the Internet of Things. I mean, you have one association per UE. You will probably get more than 64K in one node. So we don't, the, the actual security sessions just return a handle, a transparent handle. So there, there's the, the instance ID is for the device. So it would be related to be one instance ID, which would correspond to a port ID or to a crypto device ID. But the actual sessions themselves are uh, just an opaque pointer. So there's no okay. limitation on the number of tunnels that you create by the API, certainly. OK, OK. Uh, then I misunderstood the whole thing. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> It looks like you use the RT flow as the tool to configure any control operation on the packets. So my question is, why can't the metadata be included as part of the RT flow configuration or actions? So in, in, in that case, the, the metadata is specific on a per packet basis. So for instance, you could have tens of thousands of SAs on your application, all been transmitted on the same TX queue. So you, 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 there's nothing, there's nothing you can configure, in, in, in the, unless there's classification in hardware. There's no way of telling which tunnel to use for the packet unless you specifically set that metadata on each MBUF. So what we didn't cover, I think, in, on the API is we actually have a um, a function called uh, set packet metadata. And it's left up to each uh, device instance to implement what's done on that. So it, it's a transparent, it, so it, it can be, we've made it as transparent as possible in terms that for, for our IXGB implementation, we know we need the sec hardware security association index and uh, what's, there's another parameter that Radu will probably be able to tell me is, um, I've just gone on my head, but there's one other parameter we need. Uh, for to in the metadata for egress packets, so we we can we can we have those details when, once we get the packet into that function, we have the session handle and we can set those parameters and we're setting them currently in the user data of the um, of the MBUF. and then the pull mode driver when it receives that packet to transmit, it can pull that out that metadata and set it, send it to the hardware for the packet. 
uh, on uh, Boris's implementation, that's not really required because the hardware is able to classify the package itself. Um, but we've tried to make that as flexible, so especially when you get into maybe more advanced devices that can support further, uh, like the, the more advanced cases with NVGRE tunneling or VXLAN tunneling, when you need to, to maybe supply more details about offsets into the packet where you want the crypto to begin, that, that's, that, that there's, there's the capabilities of extending what parameters are set up in the MBUF for each packet as well. So, and just to clarify, it is possible that per flow, you will have different metadata, right? It's not. It's 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 per packet. So, um, you, you, there's not. You need you, for so for a flow. It's consistent, but uh, you don't. You need to on 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 our on our hardware. You need to do that. You, there's no way of telling if you just sent that packet directly to the hardware. The, the hardware has way, no way of knowing which flow a packet belongs to. So it has to be attached to the packet and then it's transmitted in the descriptor that's given to hardware. If your hardware has classification, then it's configured in, 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 in the, the configuration stage and then it's not required. Uh, okay, so there are some conflicts between the approaches that you have discussed, like the inline protocol and inline crypto. Uh, do you, uh, are there any data that uh, all of them are required by users or some of them? Do you think all of them will be supported or just one of them or so? So the, 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 the reason why we have three supports, so there's, we have three different hardware devices today that support these different models. Um, I, I know I, I Cavium have device I think that's capable of the full protocol offload as well. So they're, they're all of these modes and variations of, of them are, they're all hardware dependent. So it's not that we went out of our way to, to, to create an API that could support these three random modes. It's, the, it's that those already exist today. And, and there's even between, as, between the, the, what's supported on the Intel device and the Melnox device, even though they're both inline crypto offloads, there's subtleties on what the, the hardware is capable of doing and, and the full extent of the functionality. So we've tried to capture that in in the, and how we def in the capabilities, APIs, and, and the, uh, the features that each device supports. So the, an application knows if, it, if, if, it, if, you're, if you're writing a general, general uh, VNF that's maybe capable of using all of these modes, it just needs to figure out what the capability of the interfaces that are available or the accelerators that are available, and then it can load the correct data path to support that. Thanks. In the look, look aside example, um, you just had dash lines going to the look aside processing. Is that actually another PMD driver at that point? Y yes. So, uh, do you want to talk about that? So, uh, basically, the way actually the way right now we are prototyping, we are not creating a different uh, PMD driver. We are uh, we are extending our existing crypto dev driver to also register as a for the security uh, processing. It just said, yeah, from a scheduling perspective, that means... So that you're, you're doing, the, the way it sort of works in application is that you've got a crypto dev device that has security capabilities and you use your security session in, in, uh, in place of a crypto session on the device. So you use the crypto dev in QDQ. So the, the dotted lines were the denote it's an asynchronous burst, uh, you're in queue in a burst and you're getting back a burst that's been processed in some other time. So it's similar to the way you would integrate with CryptoDev today uh, if you were using a look aside accelerator. That it's that asynchronous burst API, but instead of using a crypto session that only performs the symmetric crypto operations, you're using the security session, uh, which is, on, which, which is getting, gets, it's implemented in the Polmo driver, is the crypto Polmo driver also. And, and the other thing is, um, when you have an, um, an SA um, failure, <laughs> um, the, the, do you ex have the, the, an exception path, or currently that isn't implemented for? So, for, like, for, yeah. for the inline crypto, certainly you would require uh, the exception path handling for uh, fragmented packets. 
So, like the, the model, the pipeline that I cho showed earlier, you could implement that as simply as having uh, a, a switch if the packet, so the packet won't have the flag to say that it's been processed in line, which means it should traverse the other path. That doesn't have any handling for possible reordering issues that may be introduced, but I, we didn't see that as within the scope of the devices to, because you, I think if you try to handle the reordering issues and, and the fragmentation issues within the security library, you would probably introduce more problems than you could solve. And hopefully, um, I, I guess it, it would depend on the implementation that you would hope to say if it's TCP traffic that you're decapsulating that the TCP windowing would handle that, those issues for you. Um, the, because, so the, the, there's, there's certainly complexities that would have to be handled in the application in that case. Okay, um, <clears throat> thank you very much, gentlemen. And uh, I think that's a good example of how, um, last question, all right. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me, I was politely waiting for the last question. Um, so I think RTU security is very, very special in the DPDK model. Because until now, we knew which kind of device we had. If it is a crypto device, we use crypto dev. If it is a networking device, we use ETH dev. And we had more and more offloads in networking devices. So we thought we solved the offloading configuration issue with RTE flow. We match packets and we have actions. And now you have new problems. First, you need a new action for IPsec. And you, you did this new action with the RTE security object, right? And that's fine. And your other issue is that you need to put more metadata with each packet. And you solved it in a way or the other with your RT security model for all the devices you know now. And the last issue you have is that sometimes you need ETH dev, sometimes you need crypto dev. And there we are clear, clearly failing to use RT flow. We need some, something else. Okay. So, it seems it's solved now for your devices. And next month, I will have a new requirement. And I need one more offload in my workflow. For instance, I need compression in the pipeline of the IPsec. You, you see, it was very nice. You have a, a nice pipeline of processing in your slides. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be so, that clean in real life as yeah. well. Yeah. It seems now we are going to have more and more hardware offloading with more and more stages in our pipelines. And the question is, how do we configure our processing pipelines in hardware? Uh, it, it you are fixing it only for three or four devices for now. And the question is, are we going to change the API each time we need one more stage in our pipeline? Or can we think to a generic way to solve metadata and device uh, device selections. Uh, I think that we are trying to start a discussion about this problem with RT security. It's definitely not the last uh, such offload in our pipeline. Uh, specifically, the discussion items on the full protocol offload try to introduce this problem with a suggested solution with RT flow as a possibility for configuring the different stages in the pipeline and actions as uh, the context that is needed to, to be configured and then possibly updated and queried in the future. Uh, the set metadata it might be sufficient for other use cases. Maybe we would need a get metadata in the future for the RX path as well. But uh, I guess unless we have such a device in real life to, to debug, we wouldn't know all the possibilities to cover all cases. And we have such devices in the pipeline of various companies, we in Melanox and, and Intel too, but we need to get there. I, from, I, I certainly don't think 
that the metadata problem is solved, I think it, it can work for, 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 for this model. Um, I think it's, it's certainly the, the more accelerations that are placed in line to devices, so with the, the trend towards FPGAs and adding functionality into FPGAs, I think the, the longer term there will need to be a, a, a look at the requirements to support metadata for both egress and, and ingress and how that, conf that configuration will work is certain, certainly something that I think the community needs to really look at because it's something that needs input from all stakeholders. Um, in terms of the pipeline, I think we we, we, there's a good understanding of what the pipe, what is in the pipeline. It's just which element. Like we're not introducing new stages to the pipeline. What we're doing is enabling new hardware acceleration of those stages in the pipeline. So, I guess the the obvious one that, that Boris talked about was maybe further encaps in decapitalations of uh, overlays that could. And I think that it, they face the same problems uh, that RT security. Does, what are the semantics for programming that? What are the semantics for applications to use those uh, offloads? Because w once you start pushing those functions into uh, an inline, especially in the case of an inline accelerator, you're forcing the applications to take a very different view, wh whereas before you had very decoupled the layers of your networking stack by, by moving IPsec or a tunnel overlay, an overlay uh, offload, into hardware, you're forcing the software application to collapse its pipeline. It needs to f fully understand the full set of transforms that have to be performed on a, on the plain text flow. So, so I don't think I think this is the start of the the kind of the, the, this. But um, we've tried to make the model generic enough and tried to start the discussion to enable it to go to go further. Yeah, thank you. So it's just the start of the discussion, and uh, the, the the open question is how, how can we qualify this API? Uh, experimental for sure, but is that, that, that there is no guarantee for the users that it will be the same for the next release and the, the, the other next one and again. But it's an open question we have to yeah, discuss. Like we, we, we do like in, in terms of qualification of it. We we have now three distinct hardware devices that this is working with and we have the enable them in the security gateway sample application and for sure that's not a full real world application in terms of all functionality but it does give a good feel for how this covers at least the cases for IPsec. Okay, I think, yeah. Uh, that's good. We'll, Thank we'll you very much. We'll run now before. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.